Amen. Father, we come before you thankful for what you want to do in our lives this morning. So, Lord, I pray that uh, our hearts are open to all that you want to do and, and our eyes are open, that, that every part of our being is open to receive your word today. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Good morning. Good to see you here today. Thank you for braving the little bit of snow we've, we, we got. I pray it's not a foreboding of early snow this year. I know that some people are like, oh, I love snow. Listen, I love rain. You don't have to shovel it, all right? I'm just letting you know, all right? Or plow it or do anything with it or slip on it, you know? So, so I wouldn't mind if it didn't snow again till like Christmas Eve with about this much snow. This would be about right for me. But uh, So we'll find out whose prayers are more powerful. We'll, we'll come back and talk about that in, in about a, a month's time. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about something that is, in a sense, a spin-off from last week. It's, it's not directly connected, but connected. I, I talked last week about making room for the power and presence of Jesus in our lives. And, and how we need to do that. It's a decision to make that happen. And we used the story, the account of Jairus' daughter, a 12-year-old girl who had died... And and we read the story of how Jesus brought her back from the dead. But there was a process for it to happen. And we, we looked at the life of Jairus and, and how there, there was three steps for him to see that miracle happen in his life. And the point is, I believe that those steps, those same three steps that Jairus went through, we need to go through to receive the supernatural of what God has for us. So if you missed that last week, it's available online. You can watch a video of it. You can listen to it on audio. It's all downloadable. If you're like, eh, I don't know how to get to it, talk to any of the staff here. We will hook you up and help you get to that, all right? It's really, really important if, if it's speaking to your heart right now. But this week... I want to talk to you about this, you know, uh, so here's the title, all right? Are you watching or are you sleeping? That's the title, okay? So, so obviously, since you're here, you're a watcher. You're not a sleeper, all right? So, so kudos to you. You've shown up. That, that's a good step. But are you watching or are you sleeping? And my prayer is that as we dive into this, you're going to see a part of the scriptures that maybe you haven't seen before. In fact, if you have your Bibles, your apps, or however you're going to go there, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. If you go to Matthew chapter 26... And we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus praying in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. And this sto story, this account is often spoken about when? Anybody know? Good Friday, right? Usually it's just before Jesus is arrested. And it's, it, and it's perfect. It's, it's context. It's the right time for it to be read. But does that mean that we can't use this scripture at other times of the year? And I believe that, that the Lord has a word for us and will speak to us through this portion of scripture. So did you get to Matthew 26 yet? Or are you like, oh, I'll just read it on the screens? You know, and that's okay. You can do that. But I do encourage you to bring your, you know, your, there's lots of good apps available for smartphones for free. Uh, you can always, you know, we have Bibles in the back. So always know that if you need a Bible, we're happy to give you one. So they're, they're available for you. It's, there's something about reading the word for yourself and seeing it, it, it speaks. God's word still speaks today. So I want to begin Matthew 26. We're, we're going to start at verse 36. And I'm going to read it through. It's just 10 verses. I'm just going to read it through, and then we'll go back and, and begin to digest this and, and, and unpack it. And so verse 36, Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And Jesus said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went, again, went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then Jesus came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. 
And so you can see why this is often read you know, dur during Good, Good Friday, because it's the account of just when he's going to be arrested and taken away, and then uh, he'd be crucified and come back from the dead three days later. But I believe that there's a principle here that you and I can learn from. I believe that Jesus was teaching his disciples something. Do we have any disciples of Jesus here today? I hope so. I hope so. Amen. Uh, respond. Let me see your hand that you're awake and alive this morning. Amen. Good. We, we have disciples of Jesus here. Awesome. And so I believe that there's some life lessons that you and I can learn. So as we begin to look at this, first of all, Jesus took them to the place of Gethsemane. Let's talk about that place for a little bit. That is a part of the Mount of Olives. All right. So it's, it's a certain part in the area of the Mount of Olives. I've been there. I've seen it. It's outside Jerusalem. There's these uh, olive trees there. You know, again, when you think of the garden, Garden of Gethsemane, what do you think? You know, you might think flowers and, you know, stuff like that. It was not that kind of a garden. It was actually a, a grove of trees, for lack of better terms. And when you see the olive trees, and that's what the trees were there, they're, they're not like the apple trees we have here and fruit trees that we have here. They're all gnarly. It's, it's their, their trunks are all twisted and their roots kind of stick up out of the ground. In fact, you can see marks on them. In fact, some of the trees, uh, they believe, are well over a thousand years old. Think of all the battles that have happened, all the soldiers and armies that have come over, over into, into the valley, over the Mount of Olives and down into the valley to come to Jerusalem. So literally, you can look at the trees and see hack marks like, where swords were, where armies were going by and they whacked at the tree. You can actually see bullet holes in the trees, you know, where, where there were firefights that happened, you know, over, over the centuries of time. Can, you know, so it's just amazing to see all this. And Jesus was in this garden. Obviously, there's no bullet holes when he went through, all right? There's just some, some hack marks with swords. But the point is that, that there he is in this place, Gethsemane. And the word Gethsemane actually means oil press. That's literally what it means. It's a compound word. It means oil press. So literally, it's in the Mount of Olives where, where this grove of olive trees are, but it's the place where the, where the olive oil was pressed out. And that's literally the place where he went to. And this is important. You're going to see this in a few moments. So we have Jesus there, and he has what? He's 11, you know, he's 11 disciples. Judas has already gone to betray him. He's gone to the chief priests to, to eventually bring them out you know, with the soldiers and servants to arrest him. So he brings the 11. And what does he say to the first group? He's got what? Eight, right? Eight, nine, ten, eleven. So he's got eight of them. He says to the eight, you do what? It says here in verse 36, sit here while I go and pray there. And then it says he took the three, took Peter and the sons of Zebedee. So that's Peter, James, and John. And took them a little deeper into the grove. And then what does he say to them? He said, first of all, he said, I'm sorrowful. In verse you know, 38, he says, watch with me. And so we have this thing where we're watching. Well, what does that mean? Well, the word watch is Gregorio. And what it means is to keep alert, to keep awake, be aware of what's going on. And so literally that needs to happen. But before that, if you look at the words, verse 38, if you could pop it up, it basically says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And he says this, stay here and watch with me. That word stay is mino in the Greek. And literally it means to be in a place of expectancy. In other words, he's telling those three, Peter, James, and John, listen, something's going to happen here. I need you to be awake. I need you to be in a place of expectancy because something is going to happen. And so as we, we go on and he says, watch with me. Now you would think, well, watch with me. Well, what do you mean watch with me? Well, that word with me literally means to be joined or connected to what I'm going through right now. That's literally what Jesus was saying. So what was Jesus going through? He was going through anguish and toil of what was going to happen. Now, was Jesus God? Yes. But he was also man. He was all God and all man. And so there, there's two parts of him in a sense, right? You've got the God part that is like, I'm going to do the will of God because that, that's who I am. But then he lived in a flesh and blood body, didn't he? And that flesh and blood body, guess what? If he, if he stepped on a sharp stone, guess what happened to his foot? It hurt. You hear what I'm saying? You know, he grew tired. We read that, we read that in scripture. You know, he, he had a human side to him. And so here he is in the garden praying to his father and expressing all the anguish and all the different things that are going on. Has anyone here ever prayed that way? 
You know, you've been in a difficult time, circumstances, family, finances, job, you know, the list goes on and on of the possible things you could be toiling or in anguish about. And literally, you, you don't know what to do. And you're like, God, I, I, I don't know what to do. What do I do? But Jesus says these things. He says, look it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, he knew, the God side of him knew what he had to do. The flesh side was saying, I don't want to do it. So the first lesson you and I can learn in, in this garden, in this place, is that we want to go God's way, even though it might be difficult. So as we go on, we see a couple of things happen. It says, verse 39, he went a little further, fell on his knees and prayed, saying, Oh, Father, if it's possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he goes back to the disciples, and he specifically says to Peter, if you look, look at verse 40, he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, what could you not, and now he's pointing at Peter, he's pointing at Peter, could you not watch with me one hour? In other words, could you not be vigilant and see and participate and be joined with me to see what's really going on? That's really what he was saying. Couldn't you do this for even an hour? And he said, Watch and pray, verse 41, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What, what is that all about? It almost seems like, just like out of the left side, kind of like he comes in with this, this statement, saying, look, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So that leads me to the conclusion that if you do not watch and pray, that the flesh will get a victory in your life. That, that's, what I, that's the flip side of it, isn't it? And so we're going to talk about that in a few moments, but let's go on. 42, he went away, prayed again. Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass me, unless I drink it, your, your will be done. Found them asleep again, right? And then he says, okay, guys, you know, it's time. My betrayer's coming, you know, let's go. Now, we're not going to read what happens next, but I'll tell you what happens next. As he's being arrested, in other words, he had foretold what was going to happen. And in fact, even through the garden, it was clear that he was going to go through something that he didn't want to go through. And so here's what happens. I'll just give you the, the, the cliff notes on this. All right, the soldiers come, you know, Judas comes, kisses Jesus, you know, all that betrays him. And what does Peter do? Takes a sword and does what? Chops off the high priest's servant's ear. Whack, slices it clean off. It's on the ground. You know, the guy's screaming. Can you imagine? And Jesus says to Peter, put your sword away. What, you know, I'm paraphrasing. What the heck are you doing? You know, I'm doing what God wants me to do here. And so he picks the ear up, puts it back on the guy. Can you imagine that? You know, there's blood everywhere. Puts the ear back on it. Immediately he's healed. That's just awesome. But why did Peter do this? Let me tell you why Peter did this. Peter did a fleshly thing, even though he thought he was serving God, even though he thought he was doing what Jesus wanted him to do, that he's protecting Jesus, right? He's bringing honor to God by, by serving God and protecting the Son of God. And yet, if he had been what? Watching and praying, he wouldn't have done it, but he was sleeping. You see, there's two steps that I see as I look at Scripture here. First of all, Jesus says this at the start. He says, watch with me. And so that is what? Joining together with the heart of God to know what the will and the ways of God is. Because literally, that's what Jesus wanted Peter and James and John and the rest of the disciples to see, to see the heart of God, to see the reason behind what was going to happen. But they were sleeping. Now, we know somebody wasn't sleeping because we have the words recorded. And since this is in Matthew, and this is actually the most extensive version of this particular account, it's in the other Gospels, but this is the largest one. I wonder whether Matthew, from sitting over here at the edge of the, ed edge of the Garden of Gethsemane, whether he heard and saw what was going on and recorded it all. Somebody did. And so he was awake. He knew what was going on. And we don't see him chopping off any ears, do we? And so, so here's Peter, you know, asleep, essentially asleep at the wheel, right? Not... not aware of what's going on. And so it begins with watching with Jesus. And that's what we need to begin to do. You see, when we make room for Jesus, as we talked about last week, there's more to it than that. It's not just making room for his power and presence. It's to make room for his will and his ways. In other words, it's a step beyond. When, when you have permission to come into the garden, when you're invited into the garden, not everybody got to go. If you remember, just before this, he was ministering to crowds of thousands. But who got to go into the garden? Just the disciples. Are you part of the crowd of Christianity? 
Or are you a disciple, a learner, a pupil of Jesus, desiring to know more about him? And if that's you, then the garden is open for you. And it's pretty amazing, the word, you know, Gethsemane, you know what it means, and I said this earlier, means oil press, and specifically olive oil. There are four things that olive oil was used for back in biblical times. One was for food. In fact, if you go to the Olive Garden, you still, uh, you know, you eat olives there. They have olive oil as part of their salad dressing. And you may have some at home. How many people have olive oil at home? Use it for cooking, for all kinds of things. So three quarters of you put your hands up. So it's still being used today for that. And there's three other things that it's used for back then. Back then, it was used for illumination. It was used for lighting. Every oil lamp, you know, they didn't have oil, you know, petroleum oil back then. So they used olive oil for all their lamps. That was for light. And then they also used it for an ointment, for healing. In other words, if you have chafed skin or, or a cut, they would use it to seal it over to stop any infection from happening. And then finally, the, the, the fourth re thing that it was used for, I had no idea about this, it's the primary thing used for making soap in biblical times. So think about this. Oil is for food, right? It's for light or illumination. It's for healing. And it's for cleansing. Wow. Now let's look at this from a spiritual point of view. Here's Jesus inviting the disciples to come in to where the oil press is. Could it be that that's what Jesus wants to do in our lives? To bring sustenance to us, to feed us spiritually? To bring illumination to maybe dark areas that are in our life? To bring healing? And how about this, to bring cleansing in our lives? Wow. But you see, to get the olive oil, it has to be pressed out. And it's not just like, it's not like getting uh, um, uh, grape juice from grapes. It's not like you just stomp it around. It has to go in a press that literally it's thousands of pounds of pressure for it to come out. And as I was meditating on this and thinking about it, the Lord just showed me this picture of how when each and every one of us, including myself, invite Jesus into our hearts. He's right here, right? He's, he's in your heart. It's in the central part of your spirit. But here's the thing. When you are invited to go to Gethsemane, when you're invited to go into the presence of God, here's what happens. There's a pressing that happens. And what it's for, it's to press the oil from just here out to every part of your body. Out, out to your mind, your ways of thinking. Out to your physical body to change it as well. So, but here's the thing. There's a pressing that has to happen. There's a pressure that has to happen. And that's what we saw as we look at the life of Jesus. He was showing us that very example. Lord, I know what your will is, but I don't want to do it. That's what he was saying. And what happened while he was there? What's happening? The press is happening. And he's confessing, Lord, though I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it. And literally, that's what Jesus wanted his disciples to see. That there's going to be times in our lives where, where the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. That we're going to be tempted to go the other way. Why? Because we're sleeping. We're not being watchful of what God wants for us. And again, back to the progression here. He says, watch with me. So the idea of being joined with him, connected with him, to see what he's doing and who he is. And then he says to Peter and to the rest of the disciples, watch and pray. So all of a sudden, you're not just an observer watching Jesus, his nature and character, but as you see how he's being pressed out, you then can go to prayer and say, Lord, now it's my turn to be pressed out. It's my turn to have the Holy Spirit pressed into every part of my life so that I will not be tempted as Peter was. Where are you in your walk with Jesus? Have you allowed the presence of Jesus to press on you? It's not comfortable. Look at, look at Jesus. He knew what was happening. He knew that it was going to be uncomfortable. More than uncomfortable, he was going to physically be tortured and killed. It doesn't get much worse than that. But as I look at Scripture, I see people who got this. You know, for example, Paul in Galatians 2.20, he says this, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave his life for me. So what was Paul talking about? He's talking about the oil press. He's talking about being crucified, of, of the flesh no longer being a part of dictating what you're going to do in life. And Peter needed this. He needed this oil press to be done in his life. And he was asleep during the event. And, and yeah, did God forgive him later? Yes. 
It was restored, all of that. But I don't know about you, but how many people here, don't you want God's best for your life? You know, it, it's okay that God forgives when you make a mistake, but wouldn't it be better not to make the mistake and just walk with Jesus? And, and th my answer to that is, I don't want to make mistakes and feel bad about it or regret it for the rest of my life, even though I've been forgiven. I have a few of those. In fact, I have a whole, whole lot of those. But I have less of them now than I used to because I've learned a little bit about what the oil press is about. And I'm not saying this is easy. That's why only a few go in. I'm reminded of the scripture in Revelation 3, verse 20, and, and it says this, that behold, and it's Jesus speaking, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and lets me in, I will dine with him and he with me. And in a sense, I think that's Jesus talking about this very thing, that we as his disciples, he wants to invite us in to where the oil press is so that we can see his will and his ways so that we can accomplish all that he's called us to do. Now, I'm going to ask you something, and I don't want you to take this lightly. How many people want to be pressed out? Thank you for your honesty. Some of you are like, nah, I'm not ready to sign up for that yet. But if we want all that Jesus has for us, the oil press is the way through. It really is. So what are some practical things? Let me just give you just a couple practical things of how this works for us now. In other words, here, I'm talking about an oil press. I don't think any of us are going to jump on an airplane, fly to Israel right now and go to the garden. It's like, hey, where's that oil press? And we climb in it and get crunched down. That, that's not really what we're talking about, is it? It is a spiritual oil press. So, so what's step one? And I already mentioned this at the very start. Step one of, of uh, let me just give you the title here. What can we do to improve our watching and praying times with the Lord? So step one, show up. Come to the garden, all right? In other words, take the time aside to show up. Be one of the disciples in the garden. Okay, you may be sleepy. You may have some issues, but at least show up. God can't help you if you don't show up. So literally, you have to take time aside to watch and to pray. Now listen, let me tell you what I used to think when I would hear as a young believer, watch and pray. Let me tell you what I thought. We're going you know, to have a prayer meeting and we're going to watch and pray for the Lord. So I'd be at the prayer meeting and here's what I would do. Oh, I'm watching and I'm praying. I'm watching. Is this almost over? No, no, no. That, to me, that was watching and praying. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Looking at my watch. And I had no idea what watching meant. That it was turning and facing the Lord to, to know what his will and his ways are. To spend that time to experience what God has to say for my life. And again, I, I didn't know. I'm like, okay, well, God, I'm here. I'm, I'm watching. Oh, man, you know, it's getting late. You know, I'm, that's, that's not watching and praying. Watching and praying is being in a place of alertness to be in the presence of God. Okay, so showing up, that's the first thing. Okay, this is the next one is super, super important. It's put first things first. How many people have played red light, green light? Remember as a kid, in fact, we still do it at camp and, and sometimes I get involved, but man, it takes the wind right out of me, all right? So the, the, the leader says, okay, green light. So what do you do? Run as fast as you can to get to the wall or, or, or the line that's before you, right? But then the minute the person says red light, what do you do? Stop. And if you don't stop, you're out, right? I always think that they cheated with that. But, but, but anyways, you know, red light, green light. Here's the thing. There's a guy by the name of uh, Kerry Newoff who's a pastor and a researcher. And what he found is, uh, if you could put the stoplight up that I've got, you'll see a, a little uh, graphic that I'm going to put up. And basically, he talks about green areas, yellow areas, and red areas. Can you put that up? There it is. Okay. And so in that green zone, what he basically says, and, and go to the next slide, he says that, each one of our lives on it's not going to show up. That three to five hours a day are green zones. Three to five hours a day are yellow zones. And one to three hours a day are red zones. And these are your productivity hours, not all your waking hours. And what it basically means is that for most of us, we only have, you know, three to five hours maximum of our 100% or our close to 100%. Now, let me tell you when mine is. I, I, when I wake up, I'm up at between 6 and 6.30, and I hit the ground running. I, I basically, I'm able to go, and I just go. And so I'm good until about 11 o'clock. In fact, the staff will tell you that if we're in, like, long meetings in the morning and 11 o'clock comes around, it's almost like clockwork, literally. I start yawning. 
I'm like looking around, I'm getting up, I'm walking around, and they're like, they're like, okay, it's time, right? I'm like, yeah, it's time. We got to end this thing. You know, it's just, and it doesn't matter if it's really good stuff that we're talking about. At 11 o'clock, I just seem to drift into the yellow zone. And the yellow zone, what that is, that's when you're not giving your 100% anymore. You're functionable, you're awake, you can still do some things, but you're not at your 100%. Maybe you're at 70%, you know, maybe 80%, somewhere in there. But then there's the next zone, and that's the red zone. And that's the day or the time in your day where you're almost in a comatose state. Now, Sandra has found that I'm in the red zone usually in the evenings. And she's talking away, telling me stuff. I'm nodding my head. And, and then the next day she goes, hey, remember we talked about blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't remember. No, you didn't talk to me about it. She says, yes, I did. And she'll name the, the moment and the time, what I was doing, and you know, the whole deal. I'm like, nah, I, I got no idea. And, and so that, and I'm just honest now. I don't pretend anymore because that, that causes more pain. It's better to be honest. <laughs> Sanders, not. I don't remember. You don't fake it till you make it with, with stuff like that, all right? Husbands, wives, don't do that. All right, so point is that we've got these, these zones or these green, yellow, and red. Let me ask you, which one are you giving Jesus? In other words, are you giving him the leftovers at the end of the day, which primarily is the red? You know, when you're in that comatose or almost semi-comatose state where you're like, yeah, I should read my Bible. I know I should do it. I'd be a good Christian. I should do that. But you, and you're reading the words, but none of it's computing. None of it's making any sense to you. Why? Because you're not on your game. You're, just, you're not really there. You're trying to do your Christian service. You're trying to be faithful to Jesus. I get it, all right? It's better than nothing, but that's not what God wants from you. Listen, you don't want to be sleeping in the garden. You don't want to be sleeping in the oil press because you're going to miss what God's got for you. You've got to give him the green zone. And so that might mean for some of you getting up a little earlier in the morning if, if that's your green zone. And for each and every one of us, it's different. There are some people, their green zones at night. For me, I have a little green zone after lunch, after I get past the tired phase. You know, you have the, I don't know what they call it, the carb thing where you're like, you know, you feel. After that, I, again, I'm back in the green zone for, for a little bit of time. But then I quickly, after a half hour, hour, I'm in that yellow zone. How many people know what I'm talking about? That, that your day has a cycle of some sort. And again, it's different for everybody. And, and I understand that. But the point is, what are you giving Jesus? Are you giving him the leftover of the zones of your day? Or are you giving them that bright green, well, what's supposed to be a bright green zone of your day, where you're giving everything to him? And you need to do that. Here's why. If you want all that he has for you, that's the zone you want to give him. And it doesn't mean you have to give him three to five hours of it. You'd be shocked if you give Jesus a half hour of your green zone, it will be life-changing for you. In fact, think about this. We had the account of the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm not sure how long that event happened. I don't think it was very long. I, I just have a sense of that. I don't think it was that long a time. And yet, for the person that was awake, in this case, Matthew, who recorded this, it was a life-changing event for him. How many people want a life-changing event with Jesus? You got to give him the green. You got to give him the green zone. That's what he needs from you. So how do we respond to this? Well, as I have prepared this message, first of all, the Lord spoke to me. I had never seen the four things that oil is used for. And, and man, when I looked that up and I saw that, I said, this connects. You know, he wants to bring cleansing. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring illumination. He wants to bring sustenance. That's the heart of God for each and every one of us. But if we want that, we've got to be awake and with him, you know, we got to be watching with him. And then the next step is to watch and pray. And what that means is we turn, and, and the word pray is, again, a, a double, it's a compound word. It means to turn and bow and speak your will with the Father's will. In other words, there's communication with him. How many people want to do that more effectively? Father, you see hands raised everywhere in the sanctuary. I pray right now in Jesus' name that, that some part of what I said today has triggered your heart in their life. That a little more of the oil of the presence of the Spirit of God would spill over into our minds and into our bodies that when temptation comes to sin against you, even though sometimes we think we're doing things in your name, when Peter took that sword out, Lord, he thought... He was doing the will of the Father. And he was doing everything but the will of the Father because he wasn't watching with you. 
And so, Lord, I pray that we don't fall asleep as the disciples did, but that we give our green time, our best time to you so that we can be vigilant and awake and know what your will and your ways are. So bless each one here in Jesus' name. Amen.